Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you, Andrew, for organizing this class. Thanks for uh, Udipta and John for all the logistics. It's great. Um, I'm really excited to have this session. It's also great that uh, with Anne Stoller, my colleague, we have the chance to say something from the perspective of the colonies. Uh, this is highly needed. You know, Andrew, uh, maybe I was bugging you occasionally with questions about what about the rest of the world uh, in the first sessions. You know, I came to the first three or four sessions. So I'm really excited to uh, give my own uh, perspective for 20, 30 minutes. And Anne will also have about 30, 20, 30 minutes afterwards. I look forward to the discussion. I would like to point to a handout that I've prepared. It's very, very basic. Um, there are a couple of references and some names from uh, uh, North Africa, Arabic terms, and uh, from Africa that I posted on the chat function. If you go to the chat, then on the side there is a handout. You can download this uh, document. It's just a list of terms that uh, names of intellectual politicians that I will be referring. I'm sure all of you, most of you will be familiar with these terms, but there are a couple of names I can bet that you haven't heard of. So um, let me start before I actually go into the depth of the question of socialism, colonialism. You know, the, the, this class has been framed in the first sessions as a question of liberty, uh, solidarity and equality. Those were the key foundations of the idea of, of socialism. Um, here in this session on colonialism and socialism, I want to shed critical light on the practices of socialism and alternative debates around socialism that took place in some colonies. It's a vast world. I will concentrate on the African context. Um, earlier in this class, a lot of attentions were given, was given to the the year of 1817, 1819, 1819, that is the time of the collapse of the Second International, the start of the Third International, the Bolshevik Revolution. Um, but rarely was it mentioned that this period, 900 years ago, was also an extremely tense and problematic period for the colonies and in terms of imperialism. Um, and it's uh, quite uh, revealing that actually few uh, intellectuals have engaged, intellectuals from the socialist camp, have engaged with the realities of the colonies of, of, and the empires. You know, we have the formulaic interpretation of Lenin of, about imperialism as the highest stage of capitalism, but this is a Eurocentric, expansive view uh, of historical materialism going from capitalism and reaching the point of imperialism creating the condition for socialism. And there has been very uh, engagement with, from the, the socialists with the crisis that happened in North Africa in 1919, all sorts of radical experiment, uh, um, <clears throat> communes, uh, new uh, constitutional experiments. And, and those events in North Africa, for example, in Egypt were also connected with riots against migrants, Egyptian migrants in, in, in the UK. So it's not that we could totally say, oh, we didn't know what happened. There were links in Europe and that was often uh, overlooked. We often don't associate the Munich agreement uh, between Chamberlain and, and, and Nazi Germany at the wake in the, just before World War II. We don't associate with the great Palestinian revolt. Uh, England was in, in deep trouble with the Palestinian anti-colonial struggle and had to free some uh, troops uh, to crush the Palestinian revolt. So the, the literature, even the, the great books, Hobsbawm, Rosan Vallon, those people don't address enough the actual life of resistance, radical projects that happen in colonies. Um, a few intellectuals did, and it's not by coincidence in the tradition of radical socialism, that people like Trotsky or Mao have been quite successful in what we call the global south because they did raise attention and our awareness about the question of internationalism, the need to internationalize the permanent revolution, or Mao's take on peasantry and the fact that we need to think the proletariat or the masses that need to be emancipated in the socialist project away from the industrial frame of uh, economic and political development. So 
Um, that's what I'm trying to, uh, to, to bring to your attention or try to bring to the attention of this class. Um, and Andrew, in the first session, talked about liberty, equality, and solidarity. And I say, what does that mean in the colonies? What does liberty mean for the colony, for the colonized? Uh, what are the understanding of freedom and liberty? We're talking about collective uh, freedom, the project of collective emancipation, not the uh, proletariat emancipation. Equality, what does it mean for in the context of the, of the, of the colonization? It's not possible to have equality when, when the colonial system is precisely imposing a system, a rule of and by division. And solidarity um, and the text of Albert Memmi, which I suggested today, show that there is a schizophrenic solidarity. The leftist colonizer feels there is a deep problem in the colonies, yet the colonizer, the leftist colonizer, doesn't manage to propose a radical project that includes also the colonized. So in another session with Axel Honneth, Liberty, Equality, and Social Freedom, the idea that Axel Honneth develops is saying that socialism is about the recognition of the freedom of the others, um, which presuppose the autonomy of the human subjects. So Russ Bull criticized this approach, and we could say here for this session, how is this quote unquote normative, normative force of the idea of social freedom, unquote, supposed to work in the colonial regime of divisions, denial of basic freedoms, and denial of equality. How does that work? So I'm trying to uh, offer my own sets of answers today about the complications that the colony create for the theme of socialism and for the sociology of, of socialism. So I will, I will um, give a concrete example from the case of Tunisia, uh, on which I've been working in the last couple of years. Um, and by extension, I will say something about uh, the African experiments, uh, African socialism, sorry, and, and some experiments in the name of socialism in the African continent. So Africa, with all the caveats, is not truly my field. I don't have a lifelong uh, achievement like Anne has with Indonesia, but I think it's, uh, it's revealing of some of the tension I could say something maybe in a Q&A about the specific question of socialism in the Arab world, in the Middle East, where I'm more familiar. Uh, Arab socialism was a big theme. There you have different, you know, political economy factor, oil, et cetera, the rent. Uh, but some of the points that I will highlight in Africa are also valid in uh, the Middle East. So I want to try to um, tackle the question of socialism and colonialism from two perspectives. First, I want to see what socialists said about the colonies and what, what did they do for the colonies and how did socialists um, acted and argued in the colonies. So this is the historical moment of existing colonialism. And then the second part of the, 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 the presentation is socialism in the post colonies. What happened once uh, independence was reached, how socialism was a viable project. Um, and in both uh, for the two main questions, uh, the, the short answer is that very little happened. Uh, for the first question, the socialist, the leftist, I believe, did very little to uh, actually uh, help the, the colonizers' struggles. Uh, and there were also few cases of socialism in, in Africa in the post-colonies. Um, there were cases, but then it brings the question, why is it the case? So by, with those two questions, I want to make clear that to address the question, is socialism not apt for the colonies, is not the same question as is socialism not apt for the post-independent countries. Uh, so we need to look into the details um, to understand exactly what are the problems. Um, I'm not going to say uh, anything about the Communist Party in the Middle East. I can say something. There were a few instances where uh, Communist parties were present uh, in Iraq, in Syria, and Palestine. Um, but I will concentrate on, uh, on Africa. And for that, I rely on the book of Yves Benoit, who's a journalist, but a very good detailed book, 1972 book called uh, Ideologie des Indépendances Africaines. And Benoît notes that uh, there are quite a few, there were a lot of Marxists in Africa, but there were very few Marxist parties in Africa. Uh, Yves Benoît lists four 
communist parties in the entire uh, African continent. One in Morocco, an underground movement in Tunisia, the second one, uh, one in Sudan, which was legalized after the revolution in 64, and the South African Communist Party. He lists uh, a, a small party, a Marxist-Leninist party, the Parti Africain de l'Indépendance in Senegal, but a party that is quite marginal and only paid lip service to Marxist-Leninism. So why is it the case that there were so few Marxist parties, parties in Africa? Um, and here the problem, the short answer is that there is a triple challenge. There are two historical challenge and a more uh, uh, subsequent challenge. And those three challenges that explain why so few cases of Marxist parties in, in Africa are first Eurocentrism, the deep Eurocentrism of the socialist project, the history and the historical project of socialism. The second challenge is the division fomented by colonial rule. And the third challenge, the third hurdle, is the uh, subsequent uh, wave of anti-communism as an organized system, um, as a planned strategy. And Tunisia uh, illustrate those three tensions. So I will try to concentrate on, on Tunisia, but I will also give a few uh, examples from uh, neighboring countries from North Africa, Algeria, Morocco, uh, but uh, I'll, I'll try to speak mostly of, of Tunisia. So the three challenges say Eurocentrism, the divisions fomented by colonial rule and anti-communism. So let's, let me deal with Eurocentrism uh, of colonialism in North Africa. So the idea of equality in political term is usually embedded and shrined through the uh, legal understanding of citizenship. In North Africa, citizenship was distinguished from nationality. What does that mean? People were encouraged to give up their religious identification, say a Muslim, a Jew, and were uh, encouraged to identify in the French nationality, in the idiom of French secularism, civic uh, uh, engagement based on civic law as opposed to religious law. That's nationality, uh, but citizenship as a set of rights and obligation was not totally synonymous with nationality. That is, people were giving the nationality, but were not giving full citizenship. And who was not giving full citizenship? Uh, this was determined often on a religious basis. Um, and so the settlers were the true citizens. Um, and then from uh, 18, uh, 1870 onwards with the Crémieu Edict, the Jews were also considered French citizen for all uh, purposes in the Algerian context, uh, leaving the Berber and the Arabs, Muslims, on the lower scale. So there is distinguish, this distinction between citizenship and nationality, which created tension in the universal claim of citizenship. This is a very important, uh, a very important reality in the colonies. Um, and this system is evolving over time. It's very complicated. I'm sure Anne could speak about that, etc. We're not going to go into the detail, but it had also consequences for uh, preferential migration. Uh, who were allowed to return to Europe at the time, the end of the War of Independence, for example, in Algeria, but it's all, there was also consequence for Tunisians who were leaving Tunisia at the time of independence in 56 Tunisia and 62 in Algeria. Again here, um, the uh, pattern of exclusion that I uh, explained uh, around the question of citizenship is enacted in 62, allowing French to return to, uh, to the continental France, but some of those French were never in, Fran in France before. Yeah. So the Jews who were given French nationality and citizenship in 1870 uh, with the credit uh, uh, Crémieux Edict uh, are allowed to return to France, although they are autochthonous to the land and they're uh, even, they, they were before the, the, the Arabs, so to say. So this is, this is an example where uh, the Eurocentrism of colonialism has very practical consequence and divisive consequence for the project of social emancipation. All of a sudden, the body, the, 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 the body, the collective body is divided based on those religious criteria, undermining the possibility of uh, equality and solidarity. Mm -hmm. 
other example is the question of unequal representation. Who speaks for the Tunisian? Who speaks for the Algerian? Uh, what are model of political representation? Um, this is a, uh, a serious problem. I'll give the example of Tunisia, how it was organized, but I can also give the small example of the Paris Commune. We talk about the Paris Commune. There was an Algerian Commune at the time of the Paris Commune in uh, 1871. And um, actually, the Algerian Commune was only for the European settlers. It excluded the uh, Arab, Berber, a local Algerian population. So there is a sense of who can act politically is very limited and that create, of course, tensions inside the polity. Um, now, if I move to the second point, and, and so this is for the Eurocentrism in the case of the colonial uh, North Africa, but you know, there's also the Eurocentrism of the categories that is proposed by, uh, uh, by socialists, intellectuals, think of the category of the proletariat. It is a sociological reality in Europe. Uh, it's hard to find the actual proletariat as an industrial uh, body force. Uh, the Asian modes of production, something that is very important in Marxian, uh, Marxist theory, uh, is a very, very Eurocentric category. Um, now, if I move to the second struggle, the second hurdle for uh, the, the, the emergence of socialism in uh, the colonies is the divisions fomented by colonial rule. In Tunisia, the colonists divided, and they did the same in, in Morocco, uh, apart declared Tunisie utile et Tunisie, Tunisie inutile. So Morocco is the same. So basically the land along the coast is, is seen as the useful Tunisia. And the hinterland, the rural background is described as useless Tunisia. This is the term that was used in the colonial term. Uh, there were divisions in terms of civilian versus military rule. The Tunisian Util had civilian police. The Tunisian uh, Inutil, the useless Tunisia, was under military rule, much harsher, less, less institution. An even uh, representation in terms of deputation. Um, uh, an even exposure to the legitimate institution of coercion. So we have here one uh, famous phrase of Franz Fanon, the wretch of the earth, who says that the colonial world, I quote, is the world cut into two. The dividing line, the frontiers, are shown by barracks and police station. And those barracks and police station are there where there is capitalist extraction, where there is extraction of the phosphate, etc., the mining uh, industries. Um, so this is a, uh, a, a, another example of the division. Um, and the socialists knew exactly what was happening. It's not that those divisions and the deepening of those uh, hierarchies was done somewhere far. I mean, this is done uh, under the eyes of the uh, leftist colonizer or uh, the colonizer at large. Um, and then there is the, the strategies, which comes maybe chronologically more uh, later, a couple of decades later, which is the, the anti-communism as a shared strategy, as a planned strategy with uh, devastating effects. Uh, and Indonesia is an, is, a, is an illustration of that. Um, but what happened is there is not all, not all was violent. It was also about creating splintering in socialist groups. So the more amenable to reformism, yellow trade union, etc., and undermining the, the trade unions, which were more uh, in sympathy with the Soviet Union. Uh, the killing of radical socialist leaders, a vast network of foreign aid and various institutional support that has been described in the literature of the last 20 years about, or oh, it's over now, but there was a long, big literature when the archives were open about the cultural Cold War, how much money was put to uh, favor the reformist camp. Um, and then, you know, also closer to the case I know better, Palestine, uh, because of the presence of Israel, which is itself a colonial creation at the time of the British Empire. Israel has received a lot of support from Europe, um, later, an unconditional support by the United States from LBJ onwards, President Johnson onwards, that created also enormous difficulties uh, and organized campaign to undermine the presence of Marxist, Maoist, or radical socialist group. So briefly about Tunisia, um, you know, uh, a couple of concrete examples, and and uh, and, and Memi doesn't touch with all of these, but it adds to the description that Albert Memi gives. In Tunisia, um, an example of the denial of universal solidarity, 
is the so-called tiers colonial. The tiers colonial is called is the colonial third. Uh, that means that the French and European workers were getting 30% more salaries than their local co-workers. So this is a direct discrimination that was implemented after World War I and the French uh, communist uh, trade union, the CGT, never lifted a finger to uh, oppose this colonial third. Uh, the Grand Conseil is a body of representative that existed in the French protectorate. There were 44 seats to French Tunisian and 18 seats for Tunisians. And obviously the settler population is much smaller compared to the local population. Um, and those two bodies, the French section and the Tunisian uh, uh, section of the Grand Conseil, the Great Council, never sat together. They held separate meetings and they didn't have the same rights. So natives, so to say, were parked in parallel and unequal institution of representation. Um, other example, the UGTT, uh, the, 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 the famous trade union, which has been very important at the times of the revolution, 2011 revolution, the toppling of, of Ben Ali, uh, has its history, its prehistory at the time of the French uh, protectorate. There was one main communist trade union, which was the CGT, Con Con uh, Confédération Générale du Travail, uh, which was the continental metropolitan communist trade union uh, that actually didn't like the uh, activism that certain uh, uh, leaders, one of them is Farhad Hashad, uh, an important historical figure in Tunisia. Um, so Farhad Hashad militated inside the CGT, the Tunisian section of the CGT for Tunisian independence. He was expelled from there, he had all sorts of troubles and he established in uh, 1946, if I remember, the uh, UGTT, the Union Générale du Travail, uh, Union Générale Tunisienne du Travail. And, and Farhad Hashad actually will be killed by French settler probably, or the, the secret police. Uh, he's assassinated in 1952. Uh, but Farhad Hashad actually was in contact with the US uh, trade unions or the International Confederation of Free Trade Unions, which was created uh, after World War II, when there was this big, big, big uh, moment of the Cold War with the trade unions, would they support the Soviet-leaning uh, World Federation of Trade Unions or would they support go the American reformist camp? Uh, and Farhan Hashad got the support of the U.S. by promising that the UGTT would actually side with the reformist trade union. So it was um, a deal that Farhan Hashad uh, brokered uh, for the UGTT, but also allowing independence of Tunisia in 1956, um, which France didn't like, and therefore Farhad Hashad was assassinated in 1952. So um, that's for the Tunisian case. Uh, you know, Albert Memmi in the text that uh, I propose reading 20 pages, I think captured very well, very forcefully this, uh, this leftist colonizer torn apart in, in Tunisia, seeing the actual discrimination, divisions deepened by a colonial system, yet doing nothing or being caught in a situation of, of not knowing what to do and eventually defending the metropolis, the metropolitan project. Um, so this is something that uh, uh, Memi captures very well, but um, we could talk of other intellectuals. Gramsci also has some issue I can discuss, but right now I don't, I don't want to go too long. The issue here is that um, European intellectuals in the socialist camps have really a difficulty intellectually and organizationally to convey what is going on in the colonies. Uh, at the time of the Third International, when the Third International was created, there was uh, a small section of the European Bureau of the Third Internationalist uh, around Panikuk and Goethe who were more open to the colonial struggle and tried to fight against the 20 conditions that the third condition, the third international imposed, namely that activism for the communist revolution shouldn't only go through the party, the vanguard party or the trade unions, but that it could take different cultural forms in what we call the global south or in the colonies. Uh, but those views of the European bureaus of the third internationals were totally sideline and, and Lenin closed the Amsterdam Bureau or the Berlin Bureau uh, of, of, of Western uh, European correspondent for the Third International. So that was a short experiment, but in general, very few were the radical socialist intellectuals that tried to uh, um, 
fight for or include the colonial condition in their consideration. Now I move briefly to the, the second part of the equation, which is um, how, where was socialism put at work in the post colonies? And I just want to say a few things about, about Africa, and I think that will then open for, for Anne for a discussion of, of uh, Indonesia. Um, so African socialism is a big word. It's a, it's a concept that is often used to describe a variety of, of uh, proposals, projects, that were put to work or to debate first in the 40s, 1940s, and put to work in the 1950s, 60s, and, and 70s. Um, and here I rely on Yves Benoit, the Ideologie de l'Independence Africaine, and he sees socialism as the second most important strategy that was uh, monopolized, that was used in Africa at the time of the colonization. The first strategy, the most successful, is the one that uh, advocated African unity. So the different uh, projects of African unity, uh, Pan-Africanism or Africanism in, in the continent, uh, then socialism, then he lists four other ideological projects. Is the one one party system is the third uh, case of ideological cluster that Beno identifies. Then there is the positive neutralism. The fifth is cultural renaissance and southern empire uh, and debates about how to organize uh, the southern tips of the African continent. Um, so briefly, African socialism, it's interesting that we have socialism with adjective. We have African socialism like we had Arab socialism. Uh, and one could say, well, there's a tension here, right? Socialism is supposed to be you know, solidarity, equality, why do we need to have an African socialism? Why do we need to have an Arab socialism? Well, I think this is a response precisely to the uh, obviously Eurocentric understanding of socialism, the definitions and the practice, as I tried to uh, illustrate in the first part, um, and the uh, limits of universalism of socialism was, was, was clearly tested and unmasked uh, in the decolonial uh, struggles. Um, now, briefly about the case of uh, African socialism, you know, what, uh, what is really interesting for me when I read this about African socialism is how the early propose, uh, proposition of African unity, Pan-Africanism, were connected to the USA with W.E.B. Du Bois and with the Caribbean struggle. Uh, C.L.R. James, Padmore, George Padmore is an important intellectual from Trinidad who advocated uh, Pan-African unity. Um, and Padmore illustrated this uh, disillusion. Padmore was a communist. He was uh, with the Third International, but then quickly falls out with the Third International. Leaves the Third International. He's in contact with Fabian socialists in London. Um, with CLR James, etc., and he's the protege he of of, uh, of uh, is the protector of Nkrumah, but he advocates for a, a model which is actually anti-communist uh, and for a democratic form of socialism. Um, but he's uh, he's in a bind because at the time this project of pan-African uh, unity needs somehow the approval of European to reach independence. So he knows that the only way to get to that objective is to accepting capitalism as a mode of organization. So a lot of those uh, uh, African socialists are reformist by necessity because they want to achieve independence. So that's for uh, Padmore. Uh, there is Songo as well, which we can talk about. Um, uh, Kwame Nkrumah is, a, of course, a very important figure, the Ghanaian leader. He was uh, uh, pushed forward by, by Padmore. Um, and he proposed a concrete solution to African unity. He's one of the founder of the organization African Unity, uh, an important regional leader in Western Africa. Um, another very important, and that's the last example of African socialism, is Julius Nyerere, the leader from Tanganyika, Tan Tanzania, uh, who, was, who promoted an idea of spiritual socialism. The idea of spiritual socialism is connected to the idea of ujama. Ujama is uh, a Swahili term that means the community, the tribal community, or the council of those communities. And Nyerere saw in those communities, in those ujama, the principle and African principles 
that is actually what socialism is about, which is redistribution, solidarity, etc. And it's a, it's it's something that exists uh, in the, the um, in in the the DNA of Africans, so to say. Uh, and so for him, Africans don't need to be converted to socialism, uh, which he calls European socialism. Marxism for him is European socialism. He believes that the, the, the spiritual um, connection that exists among African communities is enough to implement this ideal of uh, equality and solidarity. So Ujama is based on the ideal of the rural world, etc., uh, preeminence of the agricultural development project, cooperative forms, um, and control of the salar salaries in the city settings. So it's not by chance that uh, Tanzania got a lot of support from China uh, at, at the time of independence. So the, I conclude with, with this anti-communist uh, impact is that you know, if I, and I put a list on the handout, a series of intellectuals or leaders who have been killed at the time of uh, uh, independence. It's a long list, and uh, a lot of people who were actually national leaders, pro-independence, some with some socialist leanings, but almost none were actually uh, communists. So I'm just gonna read the list here. Patrice Lumumba, killed in 1961. Uh, with two of his colleagues uh, calling for the Congolese national movement as the movement to represent Congolese at the time of independence. Maurice Mpolo um, and also Joseph Okito killed uh, by Mobutu and his uh, close uh, soldiers in 1961. Nelson Ma Lumumba, of course, is presented as this communist uh, agitator who is not a communist but is, is represented as such. Uh, Nelson Mandela, put in prison for life in 1964. He was uh, very much involved in the African National Congress. Kwame Nkrumah is deposed in 1966 uh, or 64 um, when he was traveling in China or, or Vietnam at that time. Clearly not a communist, uh, hardly a socialist, but the CIA saw him as a potentially dangerous uh, a person, so he was deposed. Maurice Yameogo in Burkina Faso, Duvalta, deposed by the army because he had communist sympathies. Eduardo Mondlane, this is the Frelimo in Mozambique, killed by a bomb uh, sent probably by the Portuguese secret police. Um, so Nationalist uh, Liberation Front in Mozambique. Abdel Khalik Mahjoub in Sudan, the leader of the Communist Party who was exiled and returned to Sudan, is hanged. Um, Amilcar Cabral, very important intellectual um, in Guinea, killed by his rivals in 1973. The fingerprints of Portugal is everywhere in his killing. Uh, and Thomas Sankara, closer to us in the 80s, uh, a socialist leader in Burkina Faso, assassinated by his uh, um, companion, Blaise Compaore, also here with some foreign influence. So just to say that the practice of socialism in Africa is really made terribly difficult by those forms of anti-communism in the loose and very uh, uh, broad sense, because uh, many of those intellectuals were um, neutralists or uh, uh, reformist socialists. So I leave my conclusion for later because I think Anne has yeah. a lot of things to say from uh, Indonesia. Okay, thank you so much, Benoit. So I'm really delighted to be here. I love the idea of doing this, and I think we should do more of it. I think we'd also really, really learn a lot. Um, I love that Benoit starts with practice because I don't actually think, and this is not in, a, against you, Benoit, in any way, I don't think that we can write the history of the practice of socialism at all and colonialism. I think what we have is an elite intellectual view of it, of what the position papers were, and what Sukarno said when he opened the Bandung Conference. I think there's been some really brilliant work on the much earlier socialism. The elephant in the room for me is Islam. And Islam is so rarely discussed explicitly because it is what divides again and again, right? Why a European left can't handle what socialism looks like on the ground. What socialism looks like that isn't a Eurocentric socialism, 
but a socialism that emanates in many ways the way you were talking about in, in Africa from something that is already inherently a part of people's lives, right? And that there's a way in which they're pulling on something that I was brainwashed. So I, I lived in, um, in Indonesia 40 years ago, first time I was there. And I, my own history in some ways, I wanna tell you and take five minutes for it, is a history of this class in a way, Andrew. I started my work being a, a Marxist feminist, right, in the 1970s. I studied imperialism. I read Lenin. I read Rosa Luxemburg. I read Kowski. And uh, then I went to work for graduate school on the multinationals in Sumatra, um, where was the center of one of the most um, active um, labor unions in Southeast Asia and where more people were killed during the 1965 coup than just about anywhere else. Um, the word socialism wasn't part of that story. It was always about communism and it was always about labor unions. After I did that study in 1970s, and this was a, the murders were in 65, 66, I went to China to track down the former leaders of the left-wing uh, labor unions. Um, and it's interesting because what, what Memi has to say, I met Memi when I was doing some of my own work in Paris. What Memi has to say is actually a story that's autobiographical. It's about him. It's not, I don't know how much we can count on what he says. It kind of works. People have loved it. It's very popular. Thousands of, of, of reprints. But really what Memi is saying is a Jew, and it was as white but not quite, he couldn't stay. He couldn't stay as a lefty, and he couldn't stay um, as, as somebody who was white, and he couldn't stay because um, it just was impossible. It was impossible for him to sustain any notion of equality, of liberty, of freedom. And what did Memi do? almost exactly the way you literally are writing his autobiography. He goes to Paris. He goes to Paris when Tunisia has independence. He goes in, what is it, 57 to Paris. And um, he writes this in 56, or is it, he got, they had, is it independence in 56? And he goes, he writes in 57. I think I got it, I got it backwards. Um, the issue though for me about, so I've been kind of studying this issue of, of what it is to be left and what it is to, um, to live in a place that is subsumed by empire most of my, most of my um, career, most of my, most of my life. Um, something's happened over the last eight years that all of you should know. And it's a really, really important part of, of pulling the thread from these early, early movements to what's going on now, and it's Bandung. And I don't know how many of you have heard about the Bandung spirit. Could you just tell me, has everybody know, or is it, you're going, oh God, and of course we know. No, okay, okay. So at the American Historical Association meetings, um, Antoinette Burnett, who was a, um, a historian, a British historian, one proposed a session at the American Historical Association on the Bandung spirit, which has become this extraordinary explosion of work around it that I'll tell you about in a moment. It was rejected because no one had heard of the Bandung spirit. The Bandung spirit derives from a supposedly non-aligned conference, right, in 1955 that where the major, major non-Western um, leaders of the world can be. Over the last six to seven years, I would say, there's been probably a hundred pieces that have come out on Bandung. Bandung is a spirit that is the genealogy of black power. Bandung as the moment that explains Pan-Africanism. Bandung as the moment that can save us now, 
because internal to it was a notion of socialism that was not about Europe, that was about translating something in a way that it doesn't mean they didn't study in Europe. All these guys studying in Europe, they were all aristocrats from the places and vastly rich, the guys, most of them, who came to Europe and studied in Leiden, studied in Paris. Aimé César's wife, Suzanne, studied um, philosophy at the Ecole Normale. I mean, how much more, you know, privilege can you get? Um, they moved through Europe, but they did something when they went back to where they were. And they didn't take the quotations all from Marx and from Engels and from Hegel. They did something in which they kind of indigenized in many different kinds of ways, what socialism could actually mean to them. So in Indonesia, there's a newspaper that still exists, but it has a very different meaning. It's called Kedaulatan Rakyat. Rakyat means the people, and Kedaulatan means the sovereignty of the people. And it was a term that was part of the really, really early formation in the 1920s of socialism in Indonesia. The term was used. It later, the later term became communism as the PKI, as Sukarno took over, as various ties to Russia first, and then those were cut, and then ties to China became stronger and stronger. Cadres went to, to, throughout China to study. But in the early 1920s, um, there was um, a young, a young maverick, really quite brilliant um, um, student uh, named Sultan uh, Cherir. And I'll send you all the references. I didn't do what Benoit did. Um, his name is S-J-A-H-R-I-R. And he moved back and forth between Amsterdam through Leiden, through Bandung, through Jakarta. And way before the Bandung spirit arose, he was already formulating something which he called Siddiqat Islam. Siddiqat means the union and Islam means Islam. And he was looking in 1917 and 1960 at the ways in which a socialism grounded in Islamic principles could live and survive. He was eventually killed off by the Dutch in, in exile. But I think it's a very interesting moment of non-cooperation way, way before there's a big sort of um, explosion of interest in, 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 in those issues. Because he's looking at what he calls a kind of, there was something in the Dutch colonial policy called the ethical policy. And what he did is he turned the term ethics around to Islam and made the, the, the ethic that which emanates from Islam itself rather than from a Dutch policy. So these moments, um, I find really interesting why we turn now to, to Bandung as kind of a moment of salvation. And what's very interesting, and one of the people who's considered to have been there and to have led it was Nukrama. Am I pronouncing his name right? Nukrama. Nukrama was never there. He never made it to Bandung. Dr. Chatterjee writes about he, how he went to Bandung. Robert Young writes about how he went to Bandung. Um, there's something about the myth, without being disdainful of it, a myth that exceeds actually what happened in that place. The reason that I, I'm so uncomfortable about practices is not because I'm, I'm uncomfortable about practices, Benoit. I think you're dead right to start with practices. Is that it's almost impossible to write about Bandung, about practices. Everything is about the speeches. Everything is about, about the pictures. You can get hundreds of pictures on the internet. And they're all of everybody dressed in their sort of ethnic clothing and very, very formal, because you can't almost not see um, normal people, regular people, the sort of populace. You sort of see them on the edges, but they're kept way, way outside of the story. And so one wonders what, what actually happened in, in Bandung as far as we know is there was an enormous amount of conflict. 
enormous amount of conflict about how present China was and how much it needed or not to be there, what Nehru was actually doing there and how much he imagined that colonialism, anti-colonialism was the center of the movement and how much communism had to be kept sort of at bay while well, some notion of what we might call socialism was actually more, it seems, on the table. Though when people are writing about it, they're writing just more about the Bandung spirit of non-cooperation and non-alignment. Some people writing about it right now are saying that actually they were very aligned. It was just under the table, that there were all these other kind of alignments going on. Um, Anti-colonialism was part of the story. Redistribution of some forms of land and other issues were sort of part of the story. But in terms of the actual specifics of what practices were going to be implemented besides some unity and diversity, which ended up being the motto of Indonesia that Sukarno took up, the actual practices are very, very hard to determine what people went home with, right? It was almost as if this was a performative. And I mean that in Austin's sense of a performative. That is, it was something to enact something to happen rather than what, what was actually already in progress. It was a illusion, right, of what should be rather than what was already is. It was, did you want to say something, Benoit? Did I see you go? Oh, no. Um, so the notion that third worldism emerged or that anti-racism, which is another really big part of the myth, that anti-racism emerged. I mean, somebody like Nehru was very against it and anyone from the Middle East was furious about it because they didn't see themselves as black. Or when, when Sukarno, during his early, his speech to open up Bandung, said, and this is the first time in the world that people of color are coming together. Actually, people, many people from the Middle East were not happy about that declaration at all. Um, so when I say it was, it was a performative, it was even just a performative for some people um, and not for others. Um, one of the things that I think is interesting that before Bandung is the way in which you can almost see certain understandings of practice that are more closer to what I would call practice. One of the things that Sharir emphasized was social pedagogy. I think that's a beautiful term. Social, it's a term that he used, that our pedagogy should be of the world and to the world and uh, a, a popular kind of pedagogy. It was, um, he called it an education of the masses um, and a contemptuous um, um, treatment of what he saw as the moderate European socialists who he called champagne drinking hypocrites. Um, so the division between this socialism that was imported versus a socialism that was recalibrated in some way is still a, a history, I think, to be written. And is still being written in really a very sort of piecemeal fashion. I just was in Indonesia last January. And as far as I know, there is now one book only on Bandar. One book that just came out by a young, in Indonesian, that's being translated now into English, by a young Indonesian historian. And basically, again, it is all the, as they call them, the pidato, all the speeches, all, all the, the big, big men who were there. Yes, there were women there in their ethnic attire. Um, but it is a story that really still needs to be, um, reconnected in so many ways. Um, I think that's all I'll say for now. Um, one that, oh no, I had one, one thing I wanted to, to tell you about was something beautiful that you should all read. Uh, well, there are two things, one you shouldn't read and one you should, um, is what is called Socialism and Colonial Policy by Kowski in 1907. And 
whoever made this, can you see this? Of a little boy of color carrying a kind of hats, those hard hats that Dutch colonials wore and crying. So whoever made this, I'm not sure. But socialism and colonial policy is a debate about why people like um, Van Kool thought it was possible to imagine what he called a socialist colonial policy, that this was indeed an oxymoron. And Kowski wanted to show why that was an oxymoron and why that was an impossibility. Um, and it's an enormous clarity in terms of what kinds of positions could be held and whether any sense of equality could ever emerge or whether what socialism in the colonies was going to do was hold on to the forms of cheap labor that they had so that material could come into the West, right? But, but practice reform. So Van Kool, I'll just tell you, I'll leave you on, on the note of Van Kool, was somebody I studied 40 years ago because Van Kool was for me, I thought, a hero. He was the Dutch socialist who came to where I worked in Sumatra on the plantations. And in 1903, he came to say how atrociously women were being treated and that children were on the plantations. It turns out that Van Kool, much to my surprise, um, even though he fought for reform in the colonies as the socialist in the Dutch, the Dutch parliament, he actually was endorsing colonialism all along. And he says, what we need is to reform what they do, not get rid of it. Um, whereas Kowski saying this is absolutely an untenable situation. So the, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send some of these unbelievable references. There is an unfortunate reference, and I didn't only found out the other day that it's from Constellations. And it's by somebody um, at um, Johns Hopkins called Robbie Shilliam, who's become very, very well known now for the Bandung spirit and seems to write about Bandung without knowing what happened at Bandung at all. And it's not clear, maybe, you know, this is, this is a good thing. He's kind of bringing the myth of whatever he imagines Bandung to have been to what he sees as decolonizing movements today. But in fact, it's a piece that's just sort of full of, um, of, of, of a lack of knowledge on, on, on Bandung and quoting people who also um, got it wrong. So, you know, we're in a weird, weird moment with um, how socialism and anti-colonialism and socialism and colonialism all come together. Thank you all. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Anne and, and Benoit. Uh, this is very, very excellent. Uh, I have only a few things to, to, to say. So there is... Uh, to Memmi's text, but I want to actually talk about very briefly about something which the text doesn't even discuss, although I'm sure it's very familiar to, was very familiar to Memmi, uh, namely uh, uh, the, uh, the European origins of, uh, of the ideas of the European left. So he's, Memmi's leftist or radical uh, allow, uh, is in the colony, either he's born there, she's born there, or immigrates there for some reason. But they take package with them, and that is a theoretical tradition. And I think rather than call it Eurocentric, uh, right, right off the bat, I would first call it European, right. in the sense that uh, mm -hmm. uh, it, um, it, it, early socialism is an authentic expression of the uh, uh, of the uh, injuries uh, of the uh, uh, dehumanization of the economic hardship of a of of of, of a very specific people uh, first and foremost uh, in uh, in the United Kingdom who are undergoing early industrialism so socialism uh, uh, whether it is of then of Owen type or the Fourier version or any other version is born in Europe authentically because it is responding to uh, uh, to issues issues in in Europe. Uh, this did not mean uh, the development in itself 
of a Eurocentric theory, but it so happens that Karl Marx developed such a theory because of the linear notion of historical development, the idea of progress, and uh, and the assumption that modern industrialism is the telos, is the teleology of uh, of human development. So, for example, this also uh, would push him in a direction that is even more politically Eurocentric. For example, his texts on India, which are pro-colonial in the sense that yeah. to the extent that India is going to have, uh, 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 is going to reach the telos in question, uh, it will be, uh, uh, it will be uh, uh, benefited. It will benefit from colonialism, uh, which will represent its specific road uh, to modernity and to the kind of thing that has to be achieved. But this is part of the heritage of European leftists. Uh, uh, you know, I, uh, Anne very nicely points out that someone like Kautsky, and I think the same is true for Rosa Luxemburg and even Lenin, yeah. become nervous about this heritage and become critical of it, and they uh, don't like it anymore. They are very critical of people who actually rely on it, uh, either politically or theoretically, but, but they're a minority uh, necessarily uh, within the tradition uh, the uh, the works of the master uh, were dominant even if the master himself for example when it came to Russia uh, uh, try to moderate some of these some of these views there may be other roads to the future than this British uh, European uh, industrialization road so that's that's sort of one problem and I think uh, uh, until really, and I think Benoit mentioned this, until Mao, uh, who has to uh, accomplish a revolution in a very different setting, uh, until Mao, uh, there is no radical transformation of, of this view within Marxism itself, and probably one could even show that Mao did not go far enough. Uh, uh, and, and so this is uh, one, uh, one issue that has to be, has to be uh, confronted, and I think that uh, in that sense, uh, reinventing or recalibrating, as Anne says, socialism in each and every place uh, was necessary. First of all, as Mao already recalibrated it for a peasant country, mm. but also recalibrating it in other senses. Yeah. I, think, I think the traveler of Alberto Mami uh, recognizes a couple of these senses, but he cannot or she cannot do anything about it. And this has to do with not just the ideological baggage he or she carries, but the ideological frames that he or she confronts in the colony. Because Memi stresses two dimensions of this, uh, but I think probably there are many others, but these two are the big macro ideological frameworks, namely religion and nationalism. Yep, those are the two. Religion and nationalism. Because whether it is Marxism, but I think this is even true for Owen and Fourier uh, and Cabet and all the rest, for them, uh, religion belongs to the past. And not only does it belong to the past, yeah. all the way down to Castoriadis, it is also heteronymous. It is not consistent with human autonomy, however you're going to define it. So religion is a problem uh, from the outset. And yet, in a colony, uh, uh, and of course even in a post-colony, uh, the traveler or the colon or the uh, uh, or the colonial, let's call him only her colonial and not a colonialist or a colonizer, but still a colonial, uh, uh, initially has to encounter this, which is inimical uh, to what he or she has uh, learned to believe and. And, and it's on a very deep level uh, that, yeah. that religion challenges those beliefs. And nationalism, mm -hmm. similarly, because uh, as uh, uh, one learned right away, uh, if one was a Marxist, and certainly this is learned within the socialist movements, the working man and woman does not have a country. Suppose they doesn't have a country. They're supposed to have solidarity, not just with the workers of their own country, but international, international working class. And the reason why the umbrella organizations are always named the international is because such an attempt, an attempt is made to in fact 
internationalized the struggle. Trotsky's permanent revolution becomes an eventual political development uh, of that on perhaps the highest, the highest level. But the colonial discovers in the colony, maybe nicely puts it, that nationalism uh, and even uh, ethnicity are defense of the colonized, are forms of defense of the colonized. Exactly. They cannot just be without nationalism because nationalism is a way to fight. And indeed, religion and nationalism sometimes even together are ways of fighting uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the presence and the oppression and the dehumanization uh, instituted by the uh, by the colonialist uh, and the colonizer, uh, and so in that sense, uh, the conflict uh, between uh, the views uh, of the of the uh, uh, of the socialist uh, 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 run into very very serious. Uh, 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 issues uh, with, uh, with the inherited ideologies. May, I, can I just say one little thing, um, Andrew, that I think is important to think about, and we won't have time in this seminar, but I think one of the things that we've done here is we've left in a very kind of conventional way what the political is and assumes that we know what it is, right? That I don't mean you're being conventional or I am. There is a convention we're, we're subscribing to here that is in the terms of parties and it's terms of organizations. Well, one thing that has really struck me that I've been, I've been working on something that I call the anti-colonial avant-garde on the aesthetics and how the aesthetics and politics actually reconvene what the political is. That there are all these aesthetic moves that people like Amé César and Susan César and André Breton took in, combining with surrealism, that it didn't just come out to be politics as parties. It came out to be another set of practices um, that really revamped even what art is, because it wasn't just in the form of art on a wall. It's the kind of art of living, living in a more socialist way. And I'd, I'd love, I mean, I don't think I'm going to ever do that study, but I, I started it. Um, somebody's going to do it gorgeously someday. Um, but I think what they're actually doing is redefining the political. I think that, that that's what we might miss in some ways. But, but, and this yeah, is fantastic. Yeah, but, I think but, I'm done anyway. I, yeah. Can I, but isn't that also an elite uh, move? Well, I don't know. I mean, I wonder if, if it is. I wonder if it remains there with, right, Susan Cesar coming back with her skills from the Ecole Normale or not. Or it's their sort of cosmopolitanisms that, you know, allow them to operate in that particular way. Um, I don't know. I you know, know, because I see in Palestine, for example, there are scholars who've been studying the Palestinian mobilization away from you know, the, the Arab socialist supports from Nasser and, and, uh, right. and versus Israel. And there is also this, you know, Che Guevara was in, in Gaza. It was a very mundane issue of sugar from Cuba. It's a right. country continental. So there is an aesthetic which is shared on a popular basis or, you know, that is popularized in the 60s, which is right. which which could go towards what you're describing, you know. So well, I was thinking of people like... Empirical research. To, to, I was thinking to, like uh, Raja Shahide, his work on incredible Palestinian poet, um, and the way he pulls on whole sets of traditions to write that poetry, right? You're right, the po writing the poetry, he's, he is a leap, but what he does with it is very much more grounded in some way. But uh, you're, you're right, that was, it's very fair. Yeah. Well, let's open up the floor to the, to the class. Uh, I'll start by thanking uh all Benoit and uh, Andrew for, for making this uh, happen. And uh, I will focus uh, more on the Tunisian experience that Benoit uh, uh, had presented uh, simply because uh, I am Tunisian, as uh, many of you know. And uh, I would like to understand the, uh, the uh, Tunisian experience, which is, uh, as Benoit mentioned, uh, very similar to uh, at least the North African uh, experience. Uh, 
You mentioned, uh, Benoit, that the challenge in your job, the, uh, the, there are three, uh, uh, three things or three challenges that caused or uh, mitigated the socialism experience. Uh, which are which are the Eurocentrism, the division that col the colonial power has uh, implemented in society, and uh, the subsequent uh, uh, anti-communist uh, wave that happened after that. But uh, in my view, I think these are just the manifest. These are just the contrast that uh, that we can see why socialism didn't work, and and. and Perhaps we have to have a, a longer uh, view or a wider perspective to understand the, uh, the, uh, uh, the phenomenon. And what I mean by that is, pre, in a pre-colonial, uh, in the pre-colonial Tunisia, at least, the uh, the uh, the society the, the society composition was different. Uh, the, uh, for instance, uh, the uh, as, uh, as as has been previously mentioned, the role of religion uh, in, in the people's life, but also in uh, as an institution. Like religion was present as an institution in Tunisia, uh, whether as an economic institution or as a legal institution. That I think has to play a role. And the yeah. second element in, in the in, in understanding uh, uh, of this phenomena is uh, is the absence of capitalism. And uh, in contrast with the European experience, there was no capitalism, or the development of capitalism was not to the extent uh, that had, that Europe has been uh, uh, seen at that time. So we we're. To that extent, we cannot understand a development of socialism movement uh, with an absence of the capitalism movement. The third element is the the the, uh, the nature of the society itself, and, and here I, I I perhaps recall uh, uh, Max Weber uh, understanding of uh, the Gemeinschaft society versus a Gesellschaft society, and in the sense that. Tunisia was very much a a, a mujtama uh, rather than a a a uh, a, uh, a, uh, a task uh, or a role uh, or a society where everybody has a precise role to play. So this is from one 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 dimension. The second dimension is the demand. What what society is demanding? And for Tunisia, pre cult pre-colonial Tunisia, the demand was pretty much a reform. And the reform started in the 18th, uh, 19th century, beginning of 19th century and, 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 and mid 19th century. But when, when, uh, when, when, uh, when, the, when, when the, col the colonialization uh, happened, the demand became uh, liberal demands rather than social, uh, social demands. What I mean by that, for instance, a demand for a parliament uh, that was, in, I think, in the 1930s. Uh, I will stop here for now, and uh, perhaps I will come back okay. with, uh, with, with other questions. Okay, that's fine. Um, yeah, thanks, Abdullah. This is um, absolutely uh, an absolute fair point that the long durée perspective might generate a different mm -hmm. analysis, um, and I think it's 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 an absolute fair point, and I'm I'm glad you bring that. It's uh, you know I think what you're talking about is the role of um, bourgeoisie class formation in the Tunisian context and the question of religion. Uh, favoring economic development uh, <coughs> not. And so this is absolutely a uh, valid point. I mean, it's a complication not to take the colonized society as a homogenous block or, or as if 
everything starts with colonialism. And I, I'm also very much allergic to that type of analysis that just start with colonialism and that doesn't look at what happened before. And you know, I'm, I'm writing a chapter on Yemen and Tunisian before colonialism, at the time colonialism and citizenship nowadays. That's the book I'm, I'm finishing now. And I do exactly that. I, I go back to the Ottoman period, etc., And I try to, to understand the existing social structure of governance, of economic uh, extraction, etc. I do not go so much into the, the question of religion, you know, in, in Tunisia and North Africa, there is, because um, Tunisia is, is quite developed economically. I mean, it's a very boosting, I mean, not the last 10 years, it's been very difficult, the economy, but Tunisia is a, is a rather well-being uh, in terms of, well-being is, is, is higher rate of development or... Um, yeah, it's not your man. Yes, uh, even better than even, you know, Tunisia doesn't have the rent of oil that Algeria has, but overall there's a better sense of education, etc. And so, you know, some people make the argument that the, the Maliki school, the Madhab, the, the school of jurisprudence is, uh, that exists, that dominates in North Africa, is one of the explanations why there is a certain inclination towards uh, capitalist accumulation in, in, in that part of, of the Muslim majority world. The question of, of bourgeois class formation, it's, it's absolutely a central question. Um, but, you know, I, I, I'd be careful with the, the, the theme of the nature of uh, Tunisian society. It's always tricky to speak about the nature of any society. It is, there is a risk of, of homogenization again. Um, Yes, there were things that happened before the colonial time. The Ottoman had a certain implantation in certain cities and they were raiding the south and the, the, the French the, during the protectorate used this system. They, uh, they deepened that. So you read that there were some structures, social structure that existed before. But I think when it comes to, especially with the point of citizenship and universalism, you know, this is, you know, at the time of the Ottoman Empire, there was no claim that there was an equal uh, exposition to the state, etc. I mean, the, the Ottoman Empire was very clear. It was about stability. You pay tribute, and will you're off the hook, right? If you pay your tax. Um, and and the, the 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 thing that existed before the protectorate in terms of representation and the Din is only the cities that are represented. So you know, there there was something at the time of the of the Ottoman Empire or already some some divisions but it is so amplified and becomes so deeply embedded in the economic and administrative practices at the time of colonialism that I think one has to make a point that colonialism also influenced badly. But anyway, I take your point about the long jury perspective. This is very, it's a very apt uh, observation. Thank you. Yeah, well, uh, about the post-independence, uh, post, uh, can you elaborate more about the failure of uh, Socialist, the socialism post independence, the Nasser experience in, uh, in Egypt, and also there was an experience, a very brief experience of uh, uh, co uh, cooperative uh, economy in Tunisia as well. The yeah, oh, Arab socialism. Um, yes, there was, there was an experiment uh, under Nasser, um, also under competition from the Ba'athist um, model of Arab socialism, Arab unity, etc. And, you know, what I try to say about African socialism, because it's less known probably than Arab socialism, is, is very, it's very similar that there's the idea of some innate characteristic of society, uh, or shared cultural, uh, um, most the, 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 the language, etc., that provides a, a background um, that is favorable for that. Um, you know, it's hard to say, I mean, I'm not sure I want to say much about it because um, it was a state led uh, system that was socialist on many aspects but it was also a very corporatist and semi-authoritarian uh, project. Um, that was very problematic. Um, and, you know, the, 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 um, the promises of equality, for example, in terms of trade unions, it was everything going through one centralized state-controlled trade unions, the Arab Socialist Union, etc., cetera, um, which generated all those tension that exploded in 2011 for the need for independent trade unions uh, in, in, in North Africa and in, in Algeria. It's a, it's a big problem with Iraq now. Um, the FLN is the one party system. So, you know, it's so muddled with other elements that it becomes 
such as corporatism, one-party system, authoritarianism, personal uh, cult of the leader, etc., then it becomes difficult to, to see what is socialism in there and what is the specific um, impact of Arab socialism or project of Arab socialism. So, you know, I'm a bit reluctant to go into the detail. I forgot to mention one of the early um, inspirations, what I think is really kind of interesting, is something that was called guild socialism, the notion that, that society on the ground should be practiced in form of guilds. And that was what Sharia and Hatta and all the early who named themselves socialists um, looked to as a kind of inspiration, not the kind of very high floating intellectual discussions of socialism, but rather um, how to do it on the ground, what it might look like. If I could ask something of Udipta, because he didn't want to ask a question, so I want to ask something of him. Uh, uh, namely, as a matter of fact, Nehru was at the Bandung conference, but yes. Nehru, uh, but, but almost everyone said that Nehru was very unpopular, whereas uh, Chu and Lai was, yeah. a, was a star. That's right. Uh, Chu and Lai was a star. Yeah. Yep. Uh, who uh, told, of course, that this is an anti-imperialist project and we're not going to impose a Chinese model on anybody. No, we're not definitely not. We're not interested in you following us, but we're right. interested in collaborating and cooperating. But in any case, he was unpopular uh, at the meeting. And I think that one thing that is in the back of this is a very special aspect of Indian development, which may be different also with respect to this problem of socialism. That is, India also has something uh, which resembles uh, the alternative projects uh, which have been mentioned here. The Gandhian Socialist Project is, right. is, uh, is like uh, many of these uh, uh, autonomous projects all over, uh, government uh, self-organization from below, integrating religion even in the most positive sense, uh, taking culture seriously. So India has a socialism too, which fits into this international milieu. But Nehru's socialism is Fabian. Hmm. Hmm. Nehru brings social democracy in aversion into India. And more or less, this is the dominant form. How could India be so different in this, this respect than many of the other countries? And what is, is anything to be learned from that? Of course, today, uh, obviously, uh, we would say that this tradition is in trouble in either of its versions, whether Gandhian or Nehruvian. But at least it had a run, a successful run for some time. So why, why was India so different than Black Africa or the Maghreb? or even I think uh, in many, in, in most senses, Indonesia and the Pacific? Uh, yeah, I, I guess I can try and uh, address that question. And, but it seems to me that uh, the particularity of, of India's trajectory with socialism has partly to do with the fact that, uh, again, uh, like many of the other cases that both Anne and um, Benoit pointed to, uh, socialism became somewhat resignified in the in the anti-colonial um, uh, use of it, uh, in which the there was a shifting of categories, mm -hmm. one one that did not center around necessarily just labor, um, but socialism in the Indian context came to grapple with the question of caste, and and this came, mm -hmm. this became central in in the constituent assembly debates, where almost implicit in in all of those debates was that. The social question in in India was one that has to revolve around caste um, and not just uh, labor. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that played a significant part. But the other part, I think, has to do with uh, Nehru and uh, the trajectory of the Congress Party itself, because uh, the Congress Party was uh, extremely heterogeneous, uh, and I, I don't know much about many other uh, anti-colonial. Um, uh, parties as such, but the Congress party uh, was so heterogeneous and pluralistic in, in the kind of uh, participants it had. Uh, and it included people from the uh, right, uh, the conservative uh, Hindu traditional right. Uh, it also included people from um, 
the the left much more progressive uh, and almost communistic but uh, what happened was during the moment of independence um, there was an internal split with the communists and the socialists uh, uh, becoming more and more dissatisfied with the congress and they decided to break away and mm. they formed the most uh, sort of solid um, opposition to congress and i think that had an influence in how uh, congress would act so they, they although the the left parties did not have any uh, significant power but they they i think had a, a pull um uh, on on congress so they they were driven more towards taking seriously the the question of redistribution uh, and the state becoming more and more developmentalist uh, and then the third, I think, is just the particularity of Nehru himself and his own intellectual development, definitely influenced by Fabians, but also some originality in his work, which is to rethink about what the role of the state is and what even constitutionalism would look like um, in the Indian context. So I, I think maybe those three factors played into uh, the India being kind of an outlier, um, uh, but that too has now collapsed. And I think it's it's the project the pro the collapse of the Nehruvian project I think raises questions about also um, uh, the global globalization and and capitalism reinserting itself. Yeah, if I could just say this, and then uh, uh, there are some outliers because in a way that uh, the argument is presented, I know that Benoit didn't mean to universalize it, uh, and Memi obviously is writing about North Africa. But but there is there is uh, uh, there are real outliers, uh, and I just would remind would mention to you, I, I read the assignment uh, of Memi, the section that Benoit picked, but I also read Sartre's and Nadim Gordimer's introductions, and I was especially struck by Nadim Gordimer's. Why would she even agree to write an introduction to a book she disliked so much, because she's yeah. extremely critical of it. And she's trying to say South Africa is an outlier. South Africa has, of course, white colonials uh, uh, who have privileges and who have benefits and all the rest. But then one of them becomes the strategist of the uh, of the uh, uh, of the liberation movement's army. Another one becomes its uh, its security chief. Uh, a strong communist party emerges in South Africa. India obviously has a strong communist party too. So obviously South Africa is a kind of outlier too. That is the dilemmas that Memi presents are obviously dilemmas in Tunisia, which he knows so well, and probably a few, many other places, but they are not as general as, as it seems to be. Uh, uh, Can I say something, Andrew? Yeah, sure. Um, Edward Said said something really interesting once, and it's very apropos of what you're saying right now. Every single empire has seen itself as an exception, no matter what, which only tells us that our own analytic and the conceptual kind of map in which we understand how these things work is, is pretty off. If everything is an ex exception, then what is the one that's the archetype, typical one, and why have we chosen that one? Um, I've actually written a lot about that problem, but I don't, I don't know what, there, a lot of work is done in arguing that you're the exception. And for Nadine Gordimer to say, well, we had, we had X, we had good guys too, right? Or, or not. Uh, it's part of constitutive of the whole political project, not, uh, not an exception, I'd argue. Okay, Miranda, go ahead. Okay. Uh, this is a fairly broad question, but I'm just wondering how, I, I guess this is, this is a question on the socialist project and specifically settler colonialist context. And I was just wondering, Anne or Benoit, your thoughts on the experiences of the colonized under settler colonialism, whether they kind of complicate or find practical or intellectual allegiance with your analysis so far. Anne, you want to go first? Oh, well, you, you can talk about Israel. Go, go, please. No, I mean, look, I mean, for me, th thanks, Miranda. It's a great question. Yeah. Great question. Uh, yeah. Thank you for raising it. Actually, my, uh, you know, I skipped the conclusion uh, because it was too long and I want to have time for discussion. I'm glad we get to that part. Uh, 
you know, what, what I'm trying to, sh what I'm trying to show is that the historical moment of colonialism really shattered the claim of your universalism and show that there was this, this, this deep tension. But at the same time, you know, I, I, you know, I'm interested in this class and I've, I've, I've come to a, a more than two or three session uh, and thanks Andrew for organizing this. You know, we don't have, we shouldn't throw the baby with the bathwater. It's really important to, to keep the focus on emancipation. And I put the, 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 the accent on the practice of emancipation uh, to say that uh, we can learn from past colonial experience to understand the current colonial experience. And one of my conclusions was precisely to try to bring home some of the, the points or some, you know, some question marks and questions or, you know, uh, themes of research, the aesthetics that uh, Anne was pointing out. Uh, for the current condition of uh, uh, cases of, of colonialism. Colonialism is at play, settler colonialism in Palestine, in Western Sahara, to a certain extent for Kurdistan, uh, for parts of China, Tibet. Uh, we can see it also at play in Kashmir, the Indian government, you know, uh, stealing a, um, a page from the Israeli government. And of course, here in the US and in Canada, I mean, there, there is this big debate about the extraction, and how do we do with the resource, etc. So, you know, there is something to be said about the, and, and you know, I'm stepping on Anne Stoller's uh, question of the, of the, of the duress and the, the ruination, the process of ruination, which is, which is also at play in, in places where we talk. Now, that doesn't mean that we have to decolonize. I'm very critical to a certain understanding of what decolonization yeah. is and means, but we have to listen to what people say in the name of decolonization. I think some projects of decolonization are, are, are yeah. very problematic, but it is an, in, 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 an intellectual injunction to, for us to listen to what is said, maybe what is practiced as alternative form of organization, etc. Resistance to extraction, extractivism, uh, because there is a strong parallel from the colonial time with current situation of extraction. Um, and, you know, I think there is a lot to be gained. Now, of course, those are only inquit uh, preliminary thoughts and, you know, more classes of the kind would be needed. And so, I, I, thank you for the question. I think it's, yeah, I think it's great. Um, I think that we put the emphasis in the wrong place. And I've actually just written a piece that's called on a, Colonial diagnostics in illiberal times. I think that written into um, democratic um, polities, um, liberal democratic ones, is all, already so many of the features um, that have been attributed to settler colonialism itself. That, that, that democracy itself already writes in so deeply, so many exclusions that racism is already deeply, deeply part of its very constitutive making. That um, there's no contradiction because there never has been one. And we have had empire imperialism with democracy without any contradiction for hundreds of years. So it's not it doesn't pose a problem in some bizarre, horrible, kind of sordid way, right? That, that these should be seen as incompatible. Incombat they could always have been seen as incompatible. It, the question more is the Kantian question. Why now? Is it being considered in any way incompatible? Why now? What is this present that we're in, in which certain kinds of issues are being raised? But it's not as if there are new situations that haven't been, you know, anyone who's written on the history of, of American democracy knows how many exclusions were written, how many people were not part of, to create a democratic polity. So that's, that's, how, that's how I sort of answer it for myself, analytically and politically, um, is trying to understand, so why has so much of that weight been put on and why is that so satisfying? to so many people? Why do we have to decolonize what's already inherent to democracy itself? What is the need for that term decolonize? Um, that's, that almost is taking the blame off democracy and making it, well, we've been infiltrated by some of this old legacy stuff of colonialism. No, that's not what's going on at all, I would argue. 
what we have inherently as these preserved possibilities within democracies are these unbelievable inequalities um, that are just exacerbated. I want just to add also uh, to ping pong here and you know what you know, I hear your point about not to, I put too much of emphasis on practice and- uh, No, and, I didn't really mean you did. I meant no, I was no, being no, provocative, you know. I, fine, it's fine. And so I'm, I'm also, you know, responding here. I think what is important is that when we consider this question, we, we um, there are practices, intellectual practices that have been, that are mm -hmm. silenced. So Rosa Luxemburg right. not uh, talked enough. I mean, the internationalist Marxists are, are, are tend to be marginalized. For whatever reasons, you know, ideological or etc., um, there are intellectuals. Mahdi Amel, for example, there is an Arab Marxist who's written about the colonial modes of, of mm. exploitation and right. uh, production. So there are intellectuals within the Marxist traditions that are marginalized because simply we want to put it in terms of coloniality of power. You know, they're not intellectuals that belong to the right geography, etc. Um, and for me, the settler, col settler colonialism. So what I'm saying is that there is a practice of there's an intellectual practice that put the stress on internationalism mm. that was very important. Padmore, C.L.R. James, those people originally, the Caribbean, Asian, you know, trying to put experience together from Latin America, from Haiti, from uh, the Carib with Africa, rather than siloing Latin America studies, you know, Caribbean studies, African studies, Middle Eastern studies. And I think this is important also intellectually. And this is in a way what we're trying to do here to create this space where not just us, but people who have tried to, to, to put an emphasis on this translateral, transversal experience. And settler colonialism, just to finish, is also that. It, it forces us to think different cases that we don't consider as part of the same sets of political phenomena and, and make us think what is, what is uh, helpful in settler colonialism. I agree that there's some issue with settler colonialism which is misleading, but it's also helpful this transnational practice. Well, I think it's strategic in terms of right now. It's a way of mobilizing people in a way they hadn't been before. But I think what's really important is what, it's just because I'm so much older than you are, that these things, Rosa Luxemburg was not marginal when okay. I was a student. That's where I began reading. That's what I, it was Lenin I was reading. It was Rosa Luxemburg. Because what I was studying was the Vietnam War. How did that, what does that imperialism look like? What is that form of imperialism? I was studying the Dutch East Indies. So it, it was like it was folded inside out for me. I never understood how racism could not be considered part of imperialism. It, there was no way in which I, and, and, and it took so many years to kind of, calibrate and then to watch all of a sudden people going oh my god racism is part of the story or oh my gosh imperialism as rosa said is part of the story the question is how did that disappear what what were the forms of of, 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 of analytics what was the concept work we were doing that could allow that to disappear when it was there so evidently for my generation. It's Eurocentrism, is nationalism, is methodological nationalism, or civilization, uh, method, methodological civilization, all, all those things that are also reproduced in academia. I think there's a story to be told, right? I don't think it's that they weren't there, though. I think it's really, really, we're watching, you know, that kind of thing I call colonial aphasia once, in which it disappears and it comes back again and it disappears and, oh my God, we have it. And gee, I didn't realize it. I mean, it's like intersectionality. Like who hasn't talked about race and sexuality, right? It's been talked about for decades, but now it's sort of revived in another form with another nominalism. Yeah, I just wanted to make a observation that uh, I think there's a, a natural affinity between um, uh, Islamic, uh, modern Islamic attempts to kind of uh, visualizations of a kind of a modern Islamic form and uh, democratic socialism. So that was uh, one of uh, that was one observation, and then. Of course, it can take uh, two separate forms. One is uh, more patriarchal, and one can be more towards a democratic uh, self-reliance type uh, version of it. But that was just the observation I wanted to make. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, I, I can say that, you know, there, there are two, you're right to say that there are two, two ways to go. And under Islam, I mean, you know, uh, you mentioned Sadaqat Islam in the uh, Indonesian case, right? Yeah. Uh, which was, uh, which led to a stronger anti-colonial movement, right? Uh, yeah, well, there was absolutely. In the Middle East as well, a lot of the Sufi orders were mobilizing for uh, political struggles. So there is that facet, there clearly is. Um, but, but yes, there is also the other facet, which is in, in, in the case of uh, the African socialism, the Murid um, mm -hmm. uh, case is a perfect example of this marriage of nativism with the structure of feudalism, religious feudalism, which uh, mm -hmm. is problematic and, and not emancipatory. So, you know, it, it cuts both way if we want to put it in a very uh, simplistic manner. But I agree that it, there is an idiom. Islam has a, Islam, or certain practices and traditions within Islam. Muslim majority societies um, entail an idiom uh, that is very sympathetic to question of social justice, solidarity, uh, and equality, and, and but it cuts both ways. Yeah, I, I keep returning to uh, Benoit's presentation uh, and trying, and, and the overall argument, which is that. Uh, at least as I understand it, that uh, there's a tension which which prevents socialism from, you know, becoming the articulating force behind an anti-colonial project. Uh, and and it has to do with, as Benoit said, the categories of liberty, fraternity, or, or solidarity and, and equality. Um, and to me, the question is, why is it that nationalism is so effective in, in doing this? Uh, and I think that nationalism has no I think nationalism is compatible to some extent with with the with liberty and solidarity. Uh, maybe this has to do with uh, the importance of tradition and how tradition becomes a resource for you know uh, some sense of uh, an identity, etc. Um, but the problem really is equality, and I think that whatever creativity that emerged in the in the global south or, or the uh, or the colonies in terms of an attempts to resignify and, and uh, reinterpret socialism within those contexts were confrontations with the questions of equality. Yeah. Um, and and so so I'm I'm not entirely certain if uh, you know socialism as liberty and solidarity had enough behind yeah. behind it. I, I think that liberty and solidarity maybe emerge in many different forms. Um, and, and the the question really had to do with equality. So if, if Benwan and both would respond to that. I think Anne, that's you want to say something? Anne, please. No, I, I, I think that was really, really lovely. And I, that was partly because you, you made such an elegant um, presentation, Benoit, to allow us to see that. But I think that's absolutely right. And I think that is, it's, I think it's even deeper than just in the colonies. I think that equality is, is, is what undoes it over and again. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, this is fabulous. We, we need more sessions like that. Thanks, Andrew, for yep. organizing this again for John and Udipta for all this. It's, it's really great. You know, but I, I'm not going to shy away from a bit of controversy with you, Udipta. You know, we have, uh, we, we have a reading group and we engage and it's, it's great to, to, to tease you and that you tease out some of the, of the points that I'm making. Look, why nationalism is successful in promoting this idea of equality, etc. I mean, there are two very sociological reasons. One is the emotion, the emotions that the project of nationalism carries can be ritualistically carried out, repeated, etc. It's connected to the mission of the country in terms of the sacrifice, the nation, you know, the, the soldiers, etc., the practice of citizenship. And nationalism also has these beautiful things called a limit or the 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 the, the people the fact that people are misled by the idea that they have, you have limits, you have borders, right? You have walls to put an end to that nation, to that, to that, state, to that entity. Whereas the, the practice that I'm talking about is so much harder to, uh, you know, to, to substantiate the practice of transnationalism, of, of all those solidarities we're talking about, is much harder yeah. because you can't pin it down, you can't ritualistically reproduce them, etc. So nationalism has an easy win in that situation. It's very easy for nationalism to, to step up and, 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 and fool people, to put it in, in Marxist, you know, um, uh, alienation and, and uh, ideology so that that's my answer but you know 
my point is that you cannot be leftist and nationalist. You cannot be leftist and nationalist. It's impossible. For me, this is a contradiction in, 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 in the terms. Yes. You must be transnationalist. You must be internationalist. You must be translocal. Call it whatever you want. But you cannot be nationalist. You cannot believe. As soon as you believe in the way, the, the, the belief that you can organize socialism within one country, for me, the discussion is over. This is not socialism. That's either. a whole other. Let, we should start another seminar on that right there. Yes, yes. But you know, uh, uh, you have a problem, right? Because if you start off with the colonial situation, there's a colonizer and there's a colonized, and a colonizer is an external force. A place like India is so astonishing, right? This island is somehow gaining control over, over a whole world. But nevertheless, it's been done. And so then in such a setting, and you look at the Indian National Congress, right? But for that matter, the African National Congress too. And you will find that they bring together people of different social strata and groups uh, in an organization to fight the external. And whatever else they want, the socialists within the, uh, the Indian National Congress, that comes secondary, that will come some other day after we win the first fight. So in a way, the tendency will be to say, we're not, we're not gonna fight workers against peasants or even uh, workers against uh, uh, the owners of the means of production. We have to put that to the side and we have to fight the colonizer. So I think that the colonial perspective, which by the way, I'm not blaming you bringing it to the fore because that is the perspective of the colonized uh, generally, the, uh, the perspective of coloniality, I think, opens the door to nationalism. It opens the door to nationalism. And, uh, you know, we, we might lament it. I mean, Benoit, in a way, when you're shaking your head, you're like one of Memi's uh, 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 colonials who's in Tunisia shaking his head, <laughs> but nevertheless, it's done, right? Of course it's uh, the done. nationalists of course it's in, done. in Tunisia but, dominate the struggle and but, they come to dominate it for a very long time. And that's, that's for strategic reasons. Normatively, many of them don't believe it. They agree with you. We should be universal and we should be egalitarian and we should have solidarity with human beings wherever they are. But politically, uh, they, 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 they play the nationalist card, which is true for even Nehru, right? I mean, it's true for, for uh, Gandhi you know less so. <laughs> Gandhi was very pure and he refused uh, to do that. Uh, but still, the ones who really dominate uh, are nationalists. And but so, you know, um, Andrew, what's really fascinating to turn this discussion around and to see how successful empires were at retaining both a, an extreme nationalism and patriotism and a notion of homo europaeus at the same time, of whiteness and patriotism that co coexist together in this really powerful way. So how did that work? Why was that so possible to do? You could say it's the victory of empire. What I just described is the victory of empire. Yeah. Because right. you imitate French nationalism. You're in the Maghreb, right, in some ways. And this means you stay within their imaginary. You stay within their imaginary. So, so as someone like Parter Chatterjee in his writings uh, keeps on challenging the nationalists because the nationalists cannot escape post-coloniality as, as it has been formed. So there is truth in that, and it's a trap. But it's a trap that somehow we have to recognize is a very attractive trap. Of course, but it's also one of those traps that, you know, when I talk about the, the anti-communism as a system, it's also pointing to that direction. Just take the nationalist role, right? right? And, and right. so there was, you know, exactly. even, and, and, you know, the anti-communism or the anti-colonial radical project was not just a feature of the West, 
there was the struggle between China and the Soviet Union, for example, in Angola, right? Supporting the same side. So China being anti-Soviet, supporting the same side that the US did. So you, ha you have, because of this, 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 this strategy, et cetera, of anti-communism and avoiding the, the, the radical route of transnationalism, that you have this, this invitation to fall to the nationalists. You know, and, uh, and you know, African socialism is, as, as you know, Yves Benoit in the analysis he gives is that eventually the independence is, is, um, is a fake process because nothing happens in terms of effective redistribution across the borders, the national borders, etc. So this is the lazy fallback solution is the nationalist. And of course, it, it will probably win. But what I'm saying is that there is a series of intellectuals, W. Du Bois, C.L.R. James, Padmore, the, the pan-African uh, unity beyond the continental solution, which, is, which are really uh, stimulating uh, oh. to rediscover and reread um, mm -hmm. in, in the same manner that Anne has been pointing to some, you know, uh, understudied, underreported elements of, of the Bandung Conference and not just for, for, the, for the, the gallery pictures, etc., and actually looking at, at the practice underneath. And that's that's a great project. I think intellectually, there is, as Anne pointed, there is not much on that. And that's for students, just, you know, an invitation for students, PhD students looking at this to uh, go into that uh, field. But thank you so much for inviting me, Andrew. And thank you, Benoit. And thank you, everybody in the class. Yeah, thank you very much. And Benoit and you yeah. and the class.